Because it is so important for women to know about breast cancer, KOVR 13 is airing a special program tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Join Jennifer Whitney for What About Tomorrow? Battling Breast Cancer. Again, that is at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. And one more thing tonight, a, a happy ending for you. About a month ago, we brought you the story of Cinders the Cat, a friendly feline, ran into some unsavory characters who tried to set him on fire. Unfortunate, or fortunately, Cinders ran to a local fire marshal's house, ended up in an emergency clinic. Good news is, Cinders is doing just fine today. In fact, has found a loving new home with seven-year-old Elena Curry of Stockton. Okay, World News Tonight is next. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We're going to begin tonight with two tantalizing questions. In presidential politics, with 11 days left in the campaign, has Governor Clinton run up such a lead in the polls that the president now needs a political miracle to get the electoral votes he needs to stay in office? We'll have the results of our state-by-state -state electoral poll in just a moment. We begin with another question that has bedeviled this nation through several presidents. Is it finally possible that there will be a real accounting from the Vietnamese of Americans still listed as missing in action? At the White House today, after he was briefed by a U.S. delegation just returned from Hanoi, President Bush seems convinced. Hanoi has agreed to provide us with all and I repeat all information they have collected on American POWs and MIAs. And today, finally, I am convinced that we be can begin writing the last chapter. Bill secret Iraqi nuclear bomb project. Unnoticed in the Rose Garden. Ted Schweitzer says he first went to Vietnam as a medical relief worker in 1989. While he was visiting the Army War Museum in Hanoi, the Vietnam that of Major Joseph Morrison, who had to bail out over North Vietnam in 1968. He was last heard on the radio trying to evade enemy soldiers on the ground. For 24 years, Morrison's son Jed and daughter Cindy had lived with uncertainty, not knowing whether their father was alive or dead. Then, last month, Pentagon officials brought them photographs taken by North Vietnamese. Photographs um, showing my dad laying in the jungle dead. They had unzipped his flight suit so you could see his name. And then they took close-up shots of his face also. You know, we know now um, for sure that he is dead. And that is, that is a relief. The photographs ease some of their worst fears. We feel that Dad, um, because he's fully clothed in his flight suit, um, that he's not, um, he's not been tortured. It does not look like he's been tortured. We feel that Dad was fighting the enemy, and therefore they had to take him out. It, that's why we're proud. We're proud of Dad and what he stood for and what he did for his country. Ted Schweitzer says there are thousands of documents, photographs, and other evidence to be retrieved in Vietnam, and not much time to do it. The documents that are in the hands of the government are deteriorating. It's hot there. It's humid. Uh, there's no air conditioning. I, I think that we may have a couple of years in which we can still put this all together. Two years longer, perhaps, to try to produce answers for the families of some 2,200 U.S. servicemen still listed as missing in the Vietnam War. James Walker, ABC News, Washington. In a moment, we'll have that new poll in all the 50 states, which shows how much ground Mr. Bush must make up in order to win. We'll have a report on a scandal in France. The distributors of AIDS-contaminated blood get off with only light jail sentences. And on this Friday, our person of the week is a man taking note of innovation. Oh. To be elected. He could conceivably get those other nine from eight other states, which have 47 electoral votes among them, in which he is leading. Now, this is what President Bush faces. He is clearly ahead in no states, and he is leading in only three states with 18 electoral votes. Our polling unit lists 22 states with 212 electoral votes as a toss-up. Ross Perot is not leading in any state. So this is how it looks overall today. President Bush is in red, leading in three states with 18 electoral votes. Governor Clinton in blue clearly ahead or leading in 25 states and the District of Columbia, which adds up to 308 electoral votes. 22 states, those are the ones in yellow, 
are a toss-up. It is ironic that these numbers come at the end of a week that many people both in and out of the Bush campaign have judged to be one of the president's best. Here's ABC's Brit Hume. As he scrambles from one stop to the next in states a Republican should be able to count on but can't this year, the president refuses to let down, refuses to acknowledge electoral odds that show in his own polls as well as others. Don't let these sorry pollsters tell you what to think. It's going fine. I'm convinced we're going to win it. On the platform, some Republicans running this year shun him, leaving the job of introducing him to those not up for election. Today in Kentucky, it was Senator Mitch McConnell, whose term still has four years to run. The man who's coming from behind to win, President George Bush. Mr. Bush is drawing large and enthusiastic crowds at well-organized rallies that have the polish of a winning effort. That has seemed to lift his spirits all week. I have never seen such a wonderful rally, and it's great for the morale. And the crowds love it when the president, like many an underdog in the late hours of a campaign before him, blasts the news media for its coverage of the race. Here's my favorite bumper sticker of all. Annoy the media, re-elect Bush. It is mostly good-natured, and he's remarkably energetic for a man of 68. At times, however, fatigue from his grueling schedule shows through in his speech, as it did yesterday in New Jersey. I want to run the risk of ruining what is a lovely recession, a lovely reception by... by... <laughs> Wait till you hear this, you'll know what I'm talking about. He must be glad to get home at the end of these long days, but he'll be out there again every day and night until the end. It may look grim, but he's been counted out before, ended up here in the White House anyway. Rich Hume, ABC News, Washington. While President Bush has been trying to shore up his Republican base this week, Governor Clinton was trying to take it away from him. Today, in such normally Republican states as Nevada and Missouri, as ABC's Chris Bury reports, Governor Clinton thinks he has some reason to be pleased. Wherever he went this week, Bill Clinton drew the biggest crowds of his campaign. Nearly 30,000 in Chicago, more than 20,000 in heavily Republican Orange County, California, 10,000 in Seattle. Election year crowds always get bigger in October, but veteran political reporters see a difference this year. For people who are not incumbents, I don't think I've seen anything like the Clinton crowd since 1960. For Clinton, the crowds are like a tonic. He can't seem to get enough of them, and they can't get enough of him. Many come not just to listen, but to touch. Part of it is celebrity. Part of it is animal magnetism. And part of it is the hope of being on the winning team. Why did you come here personally? Because I want to see the next president of the United States. I've never seen one up close. <laughs> My kids said, Mother, are you crazy? You're going to have to get up about 5 and take a bus about 6. And I said, I'm going. That's all I know is I'm going. It is Clinton's core message, time for a new generation of leaders that most often hits the hot button and I will lead the wave of change that will lift this country up and forward into the future. Thank you and God bless you all. The Clinton crowds may be big and boisterous, but they hardly materialize by magic. A typical Clinton rally is as carefully choreographed and as heavily hyped as a Broadway musical. Chicago, Bill Clinton and Al Gore are coming tomorrow at noon to Daly Plaza. Days before Clinton's visit to Chicago this week, his campaign bought radio ads to plug it. Staffers hit the streets to drum up a lunch hour crowd. Would you like an invitation to our rally yes, tomorrow? Governor Clinton please. and Senator Gore will both be here tomorrow at noon. But his campaign's organizational skill alone cannot explain the intensity. If a candidate's prospects can be gauged by the size and mood of his crowds, then Clinton has good reason to be confident. Chris Bury, ABC News, Seattle. And a word about Ross Perot, something different from Mr. Perot. For the first time since he re-entered the race, he's going to appear at public rallies this weekend in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. When we come back, outrage in France.